morning and happy Sabbath. We are always delighted and happy to be here in celebration. We have so many good friends here, and so thank you for the privilege of being with you, and I know God is going to bless us today. I've been asked to share, why are you doing the marathon? At 79 years old, why are you doing the full marathon? Well, I started my first full marathon at 70, so it only stands to good reason that I have to end my 70s with the full marathon, right? But, but, but what are some real reasons that I'm doing the marathon? Well, number one, I recognize that you need to keep exercising. So if I want to keep my health, I need to keep moving. Because once you stop moving and become sedentary, then your health begins to go down, down, down. So you need to keep moving. So number one, I, know I want to improve my own health because I'm headed for that healthy hundred. <laughs> and then number two, why am I doing the marathon? Because I want to inspire others to exercise. And I know that when I came in third in my age group in my first marathon, that that inspired others. And then when I came in second, when I was 75, I was headed there. But I tell you, I know that I have inspired others, even young people. Young people at even Andrews University, when I was asked, why are you doing the marathon? They said, you know, I've been studying a lot, and I haven't been exercising, and you have inspired me. Others have said, you have inspired me because now, no matter what age you are, if you can do it in your 70s, I can do it too. And so I want to inspire others. And third, the third and most important reason is that I want to bring God glory. And you know what? God has given the Seventh-day Adventist Church a wonderful health message. And when we follow the health message, God will bless us. And to have a plant-based vegetarian at 79 years old run the marathon, that's a testimony to the health message. <laughs> and so I am praying that God will bless, because you know, my, you know what my husband said? Next year is a big year. I hit that 80. And you know what he said to me? He said, when she runs, when my wife runs at 80, she's, gonna become, she's going to come in first. You know why? Because no one else her age will be running. <laughs> well, next year is a big one, and I'm planning on it, so you can pray for me. But you know what? There's a wonderful text in Galatians 6, verse 9, and it says, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. And so I won't lose heart tomorrow, so I hope you won't lose heart praying for me. <laughs> so pray that I can just finish. I just want to give God that glory. So may God bless each of you as you determine to exercise and not grow weary because God is so good. So pray for me tomorrow that, and my daughter is running with me. My daughter, Rebecca, will inspire me. <laughs> uh, so I have some good inspiration right beside me, but I will uh, need your prayers as well. So God bless each of you. I need to answer one question before I preach. People ask me, 
what do you do when your wife runs the marathon? And the answer to that question is everybody needs a coach. So I'm the coach. I ride my bike, give her coconut water. I'll tell you a cute little story. When Tini ran the first marathon, Dr. Landless, who's our general conference physician, called her the morning of the marathon, and he called her to pray with her. And then he said to her, let me tell you a story. There was a little boy that was running and running and running. And while the boy was running, he was uh, saying something to somebody. And he kept mouthing something, and nobody knew what he was saying. When he came to the end of the race, a few people called him aside and said, Son, you were talking. Who were you talking to? He said, I was talking to God. You were talking to God when you were running? Yeah, I was talking to God. What were you saying to God? Well, he was saying to God, God, you pick them up and I'll put them down. You pick up my legs, God, and I'll put them down. So Tini was saying to me, as I was running, I was praying, God, you pick them up. Because after about that 14th, 15th, 16th mile, you know, you need the Lord's help to pick them up. Well, let's pray, and then we'll open the Word of God together. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be here with so many of our friends. and so uh, A church that we felt uh, at home in for so many years. And we just pray now that your Spirit would be with us. Open our hearts and open our minds. Help us to sense that Jesus is the one, and through his power and strength, we can step out of our comfort zones, step out of the comfortable convenience of our churches, and make a powerful impact in our communities. Help us know that we may be that very one person that you want to use to touch somebody with your grace. In Christ's name, amen. Have you ever felt, I am only one person in a world that's gone crazy, what can I do? There are millions of homeless people, starving people, sick people, depressed people, lonely people, and desperate people. There are millions that have been, been impacted by war, by poverty, by natural disasters. And Lord, what can I do? You know, Dwight Moody, great preacher, one day was reading the Bible and he came across that notable text in Isaiah. If you have your Bible, take it please and turn to Isaiah, the sixth chapter. And Moody tells the story that he was reading scripture and he came across this text. It really impacted him. The Holy Spirit brought deep conviction to Moody's heart and mind as he read it. Isaiah, the sixth chapter. And it's the story, you remember, it says... In verse 1, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. In other words, Uzziah, king of Israel, had died. The throne was empty. Their enemies could easily take advantage of that catastrophe. The year is the 8th century B.C. But Isaiah says, I still saw God sitting upon his throne. In other words, it looked like the world was out of control but Isaiah is saying God's still in control because he's still on the throne. And then uh, you go through the narrative, but when you come to verse 8, Isaiah hears a voice saying, and I heard the voice saying, who will I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. So Moody read that passage that day. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? Here am I, send me. So Moody writes these words in the flyleaf of his Bible. This is what he says. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. You see, because I can't do everything, I won't refuse to do the one thing that I can do. I want you to think about it with me for a little while. There's only one you. When the genes and chromosomes came together to form the unique biological structure of your personality, God threw away the pattern. There's nobody else like you in the entire universe. You're the only person with your exact heritage. Your life experience is different from every other person. The joys and sorrows that have brought you to this place in your life form the unique person that you are. You're the only one with your personal convictions. 
You're the only one with your skills. You're the only one with your appearance, your touch, your voice, your smile, your surroundings, your sphere of influence. You're the only one that's like you. And one person can make a difference. I began studying this week about how one person throughout political history made a difference. Did you know that in 1654, one vote, one vote gave Oliver Cromwell control of England? In 1649, one vote caused Charles I of England to be executed. In 1776, when I say 1776, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind? Now, here's a little fact that you may not know. You might be speaking German today. You might be speaking anyway, I don't know. But you might be speaking German. We might be speaking German today if it wasn't for one note, vote. Did you know that in 1776, one vote gave America the English language instead of German? In 1839, one vote elected Marcus Morton governor of Massachusetts. Now, did you know that Texas might be in Mexico today if it wasn't for one vote? Somebody says, well, it's with that border crisis, it's like Mexico anyway. <laughs> but uh, look, in 1845, one vote, one vote brought Texas into the Union. In 1875, one vote changed France from a monarchy to a republic. In 1876, one vote gave Rutherford B. Haynes the United States presidency. Now here's one that you may not have known. In 1923, one vote gave Adolf Hitler the control of the Nazi party in Germany. When you look back over political and social history, one vote has made a difference. But when we look at the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, and we look at Scripture, one person, one person has made a dramatic difference throughout history. These were common people. These were ordinary people. These were people like you and like me. When I read God's Word, I find individual men and women who made a difference. From Genesis to Revelation, we see God's hand on the lives of individuals who thought and said and did what was right in spite of the consequences. In the Bible, we discover the power of one. One person's influence making a difference for God. One person's decision changing the course of history. One person's actions changing the world. One person's kindness making a dramatic difference in the world around them. I want to look at three aspects of this. When we dedicate our lives to Christ, we can look at the promise that he's given to use us powerfully. Second, we can look at the power that he imparts to an individual. And thirdly, we can look at his presence, his promised presence with us. The power of God, the the, 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 the promise of God, the power of God, and the presence of God. Let's go to the book of Matthew. You remember Jesus gave that sermon on end time events. And here in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about the, his return. And he gives the final sign before his return. And here, Matthew chapter 24, the promise of God. This passage is a promise. You know, when you look at the 8 billion some odd people in the world today, you wonder how this promise can ever be fulfilled. Sure, God's going to use radio and television and mass media, but God is a specialist in using one person. God's a specialist in taking the common, ordinary men and women and impacting their community, impacting their workplace, impacting their school, impacting the medical institution at which they work. And so Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, then the end shall come. Let's suppose that you were Matthew recording Christ's words. Let's suppose you were Peter listening to Christ's words. 
Let's suppose you're one of the disciples. So here's Peter. He's out there fishing one day. They typically did net fishing, and it usually was at night, so the fish couldn't see the nets. And Peter's talking to James and John, and these brothers are out in the boat with them. There's a salt breeze blowing. Stars are twinkling in the sky. They notice some dark clouds begin coming in. Peter begins to say, fishing isn't too good tonight. I hope, I hope the storm's not going to come up. We, we maybe should quit for the night. So they talk, they banter back and forth. At that moment, three years before Pentecost, four years before Pentecost, five years before, do you think Peter ever envisioned himself preaching and 3,000 people being baptized in a day? Do you think he ever saw that in himself? Do you think he ever envisioned the gospel going to the unknown world? Not at all. When Matthew is sitting there counting the shekels after a day of tax collecting, do you think he ever had the idea when he's going, one shekel, two shekels, three shekels, hey, this guy cheated me, well, I better go touch, check with him on his taxes. Do you think Matthew ever had the idea at that point that he would write the Gospel of Matthew and that you and I would read the Sermon on the Mount today and that we would be so incredibly impressed about it. Do you ever think that when Matthew was writing that, he would know Boris's story, a KGB agent who became my bodyguard in Russia? Let me tell you about Boris. Boris's uncle guarded Stalin. Boris's uncle was one of the top KGB officials. He was so prominent in the KGB, the uh, secret police of the Russians, that uh, he guarded Stalin, as I mentioned. Boris looked up to his uncle, always wanted to be like his uncle. So his uncle got him a special provision to be enrolled in the KGB training school. He was trained by the KGB. One night he was on guard duty. It had rained, and um, the guard tower was slippery. He didn't see it, stepped on the first step, and fell. He fell and broke his back, was put in a KGB hospital, and uh, it was a real serious problem now because when you have a broken back, he would really it would be difficult for him to continue the rigorous KGB training. While he was in that hospital, he saw a news report of some of the KGB infiltrators in a particular country. He knew them because he had trained with them. And he thought to himself, do I want to do this for the rest of my life? And he began to think there must be something better in life. And he remembered one time he had heard something called the Mountain Sermon. He didn't even know it was a Sermon on the Mount. The Mountain Sermon. So he wrote a letter to the Orthodox priest and to control religion, in those days, Russia had all the uh, religious boxes, the mailboxes put together. The postman put it in the wrong box, and the letter came in an Adventist preacher's box. He went to visit Boris, read to him the Sermon on the Mount. It touched him. Began to read to him the prophecies of the Bible. And Boris accepted Jesus. Boris became ultimately a bodyguard for me when I was there, I gave him all my graphics. He went on to seminary and became a Seventh Adventist minister. As years went by, he became one of the conference presidents in Russia. Today, he's the secretary of one of our unions. You see, heaven is going to be an amazing place. Why? Matthew, when he wrote the gospel, had absolutely no idea of the generational influence that he would be impacting. He had no idea whatsoever about how God would fulfill his promise through him. Or think about these demon-possessed, two men possessed by demons. Jesus delivers them from the demons. They go and work in Decapolis, Decapolis, Polis' is city, Deca is ten. They go work in these ten cities, a place where Jesus was not making an impact, the disciples couldn't, but now those cities are open. Why? Did those demoniacs have any idea of the power of Christ 
working through one man, one woman, one boy, one girl. No idea of that. Did, did, did Philip and Andrew, and when Andrew found that little boy with the bread, and uh, he, he took that bread and gave it to Jesus, did, did Andrew have any idea that Jesus would use that bread to feed 5,000 people? And what about that Samaritan woman? Did she have any idea when she went to the well that day that she would meet Jesus? And this common woman, this ordinary woman, then she would meet Jesus that day and be so excited she'd leave her water pot by the well, run back to the city, share Christ with the city. Come see a man that told me everything I've ever done. Did she have any idea of that? You and I have no idea what God wants to do with our life. We have no idea of how God wants to use us to touch that nurse that we work with, to touch that computer scientist who we work with on the computers, to touch that salesperson, to impact that student sitting across from you in the classroom, to touch that person at the gas station, in the hotel. We have no idea what God wants to do. There are two things about this witness that are two great lessons I think we can learn from the early church. One is this. When we share Jesus with others, we grow as we go. We grow as we go. There's something about stepping out for Christ. There's something about looking at life for more than simply my difficulties, my problems, and becoming so claustrophobically narrow in my own problems of life. There's something about reaching out kindly and unselfishly and touching people for Jesus that enables us to grow. We grow as we grow. Ellen White, in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 105, wrote about a time that the church in Jerusalem began to settle down in their comfortable convenience. And this is what she said. They forgot that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service. Wow. Why doesn't it say strength to resist evil is best gained by prayer? Why doesn't it say strength to resist evil is best gained through Bible study? Can you think of anybody in the New Testament that prayed a lot, that studied the Bible a lot, but crucified Jesus? Who were those people? What, what, what were their names? They were the Pharisees, right? Did the Pharisees pray? Did the Pharisees pray a lot? Did the Pharisees study the Bible a lot? Did they pour over scripture? What was the problem? Their prayers and their Bible study became self-centered. Their prayers and their Bible study became so self-centered that they became egotistical, proud, and self-righteous. So what is it that keeps us growing? It is going. We grow as we go. Can you say that with me? We grow as we go. The disciple, disciples sense that there's something else. God uses one to reach many. God uses one to reach many. We, go as we, we grow as we go. God uses one to reach many. There is Holy Spirit power that flows through the life of the godly man or woman to transform lives. God wants to do much, much more with our lives than we realize. He's using ordinary people around him. He's using ordinary people around the world to do extraordinary things. One of the joys that I have, and you know, in, in life, God gives you different joys, is I have, I've traveled to over 100 countries and traveling a lot recently even and met some just incredible people. I sit in meetings with the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and uh, hear stories that are just remarkable about how God uses one person, two people. One of my dear friends is Daniel Zhao. Daniel is the president of our work in China. Recently, you know, it's amazing what you can do through technology. Uh, recently, I held evangelistic meetings in China from Virginia. So the way we did that is Daniel was in China, Daniel Zhao was in China, in Hong Kong, in our office. I was in Virginia. We showed both of our pictures on the screen. 
we uplinked our meetings from Virginia and Hong Kong into China. Our members were told that. They immediately downloaded the sermons so that they couldn't be um, knocked off the air. They downloaded them on their cell phones. They downloaded them on their, their devices. And then I just got the report some months ago. 10 million, 10 million Chinese downloaded those evangelistic sermons. You see, it's amazing what God can do today. But Daniel tells us this, told me this story. Do you know that there are 13 cities in China of a million or more? Many of them have no Seventh Day Adventists in them at all. Very few of them have, even many of them have no Christians at all. There was a young man that came to Pastor Daniel Zhao and he said to him, look, is there any city a million people or more that doesn't have any Seventh-day Adventists. I want to go to that city. And Daniel said, well, look, what are you going to do? He said, the only thing I know what to do is I'm a masseuse. I give people massage. Daniel said, well, how is that going to happen? He said, well, I'm going to go to the city square, set up my massage table, and be giving people free massages. At least I'll draw a crowd. And so he did. He took his massage table and he began giving these people massages. Now the community loved it. If there's any masseuse here, I'm not suggesting you take your massage table and set it up downtown Orlando. But anyway, so he, he takes his masseuse table and begins setting it up. People begin to come. They begin to come. Pretty soon he sees a man limping that's coming. This man obviously had had a stroke. And the man was in deep pain in his leg. And so this brother Chen, I'll call him, brother Chen, he said to him, I would like to give you a massage. The man said, I'd love it. He began working on him. While he was working on him, the Lord impressed him. Pray for this man. So he's giving a massage. He's praying and he's praying and he's praying. And Daniel Zhao told me, the president of our work there, he said as he was massaging him and praying for him, the Lord said to him, almost in an audible voice, this man is going to be miraculously healed. Tell him to get up and walk. And he said, I can't do that. I'm a masseuse, you know. He keeps massaging his leg. This conviction came to him. Tell this man that in the name of Jesus Christ, he's going to be healed. Get up and walk. And again, this guy's, you know, I'm, I'm rational. I, I don't want to be embarrassed. I can't do that. Tell this man, by the grace of God, he's healed. Finally, he said, sir, I don't need to massage you anymore. By the grace of the living Christ, I don't think the guy lying on the table ever heard the name of Jesus. By the grace of the living Christ, you are healed. Get up and walk. The man got up off the bed, ran down the street, no limp, ran back. He took the masseuse by the hand. He said, you've got to come to my apartment. We're telling everybody in the apartment, I am healed by the grace of Jesus. Today, in that apartment, in that secret city in China that will not be named, they have 70 people meeting. The power of one man coming. One who listened to the voice of God. I'm not suggesting that you are going to become a miracle healer. What I am suggesting is there is power in one man, one woman, one boy, one girl. Tini and I recently came from Kenya where I was preaching a satellite evangelistic series. There were 20,000 downlinks and 197,000 people baptized in that series. Just, a, just an amazing miracle after miracle after miracle. But I was impressed with the Africans, the power of one person. Let me tell you about Sister Jennifer in Kenya. Sister Jennifer in Kenya had a little tiny shop. She'd sell a few things. But as she walked down the streets of Nairobi, she saw that they had a very high alcohol problem. And she began to think, what can I do to help this alcohol problem? There's a drunk man here, there's a drunk man here. And she said, you know, I can't do much about it. What can I do? I'm just one person. Then she said, I have a little savings. I'm going to invest in a little property outside the city. I'll get some other people to invest with me. And I'm going to start a health camp for alcoholics. When I was there, she had 126 alcoholics at her health camp. She would take them out there for a number of weeks. She'd get them walking. She'd get them on a good diet. She would read the Bible to them. In our meetings, 
over 46 of those, it was actually 46 of those, accepted Jesus. She just had such a radiant Christian experience. We grow as we go. And as we go, God imparts His Spirit to us with supernatural power. There's somebody that Jesus wants you to touch for His kingdom. There's somebody that Jesus wants you to impact for His kingdom. Jesus has used down through the centuries common men and women, ordinary men and women, people that don't have any unique special talents, but people who have been willing to be used. We grow as we go. Our prayer life is deepened. Our faith is strengthened. Our devotional life is enriched. One of the favorite statements that I have from Ellen White is a little statement in Steps to Christ, page 80, where she says this, the spirit of unselfish labor for others gives depth, stability, and Christ-like loveliness to the character and brings peace and happiness to its possessor. Now, I don't want you to miss that. Notice, the spirit of unselfish labor for others, so that when, when I go out of myself, when, I, when I'm laboring for others, what happens? I have a certain depth that I wouldn't have otherwise. There's a certain stability in my Christian experience. There's a certain loveliness to the character. But notice what it does for me. It brings peace and happiness to the possessor. So there, what is it that brings life true happiness? When you serve. When you serve others, it brings life's true happiness to you. So how will the promise of Christ be fulfilled in Matthew 24, verse 14? The promise of Christ will be fulfilled by one man, one woman, one boy, one girl, impacting their environment, their circle of influence for others. Now, in addition to that, though, Jesus promises that he'll give us his power. Turn to Matthew chapter 28. So you have the, the promise of Christ, but you have the power of Christ. Matthew chapter 28, you remember? These are the final words of Christ. Final words are important. Jesus gathers his disciples around. And as he does, it says, uh, Matthew 28, verse 17 and 18. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. So Jesus meets them on the hillside of Galilee. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Notice, nobody ever accomplished anything great by doubt. Some doubted. They doubted then and they doubt now. They doubt in the first century, they doubt now. Some people doubt, can God use me? Uh, I'm too weak, I'm too powerless. What does Jesus say? Then Jesus came. When Jesus comes, he chases away our doubts. Then Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now, if you have the King James Version of the Bible, it'll say all power. There's an interesting word here in the Greek language. It's exousia, exousia. Exousia is power, but it's much more than power. Exousia is authority, but it's much more than authority. Exousia is a word that the Bible uses to describe Christ's triumph over the principalities and powers of hell. That's how this word is used, if you look at it in other places in Scripture. So Christ has already triumphed over the principalities and powers of hell through his life, through his death, through his resurrection. Jesus has triumphed over the principalities and powers of hell. So when you and I commit our lives to go out and be witnesses for Christ, unselfishly and kindly serving the people around us, looking beyond ourselves, the Jesus who has overcome the principalities and powers of hell gives us supernatural power to make an influence on the people around us. Take your Bible, please, and turn to Psalm 66, verse 3. Psalm 66, verse 3. Here is a remarkable passage in Scripture that talks about how Jesus grants to us power beyond ourselves. We go not in our strength, but in His. We go not in our power, but in His. We may be weak, but He is strong. We may be powerless, but He is all powerful. Psalm 66, verse 3, verse 4. 
say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you, and all the earth will worship you. Now notice, through the greatness of your power, your enemies, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. Some time ago, I was leading a tour to, uh, for, for Chinese, uh, Chinese pastors. What happened was, a number of years ago, we decided to bring Chinese delegates from mainland China, about 60 of them, to the General Conference session so they could get a view of the world church. We work with the Chinese government. They allowed them to come. We also knew that the Chinese government had a few people that they invited to come, if you understand what I've just said. So we understood that fully. After, so what happened was, during the general conference session, every afternoon we pulled these Chinese delegates out, and I studied the Bible with them for a couple hours. But after the session, we decided to bring them to the uh, Adventist history sites. So there were two buses, and uh, it's funny, first time I made a big mistake, I brought them into an American restaurant. Big problem. Number one, they couldn't read the menu. Number two, they had never seen food like that before. <laughs> so every day on our trip after that, we ate at a Chinese buffet. <laughs> now, I don't mind Chinese food, but after two weeks at the Chinese buffet, you know, and it was so funny because what they would do is look on their cell phones, find where the Chinese buffet was, and have one man the whole trip who was their negotiator. And he would call these guys and negotiate the price down. $15, no, no, no. $12, no, no, no. $11, no, no, no. $9, yes, 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 we eat there. You know, it was, it was really quite an amazing thing. On that trip, I met a man that was remarkable because I would sit there and I'd have a Chinese translator and I'd say, well, have you always been a Seventh-day Adventist pastor? Tell me your story. He says, this huge man, I mean, muscular, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and he was sitting by me on the bus. I said, I got to get acquainted with that guy. And so I got to translate. I said, did you, have you always been a, a Christian? He said, no. He said, I, I was part of uh, the Red Guard. And uh, this is what happened. He said, in this part of China, a spiritual revival took place. And I knew about the spiritual revival. And in one city, 3,000 people, as the Holy Spirit was poured out, 3,000 people were baptized. One city in a few Adventist churches. As these 3,000 people were baptized, this man's wife, his father and mother and sister were baptized. When he came back from <clears throat> serving in the army on a furlough and he was going to go back in, he was so angry with his wife, he said, you've embarrassed me. There is no substance to Christianity at all. You have made me the ridicule of my other men in the army. You have put our family in jeopardy. Our children will never be able to go to good schools. And he was so angry, just yelled and hollered. He never hit her, but he was angry. One day, as the Adventist church was having meetings, he was so mad, he came down to the church with bricks and threw them through the windows of the church. Um, so his wife developed a very strange eye disease and she was going blind in one eye and needed a bad operation. So she went to the hospital and as she went to the hospital for this eye operation, um, they performed the operation and they told her that she couldn't read. She had a patch on one eye and he came into the room one day and she was reading with her one good eye the Bible. And he looked at her and he said, you were told not to read. And she said, but I need strength from the Bible. He said, look, I've got a Christian wife. I don't want a blind wife. Give me that book and let me read it to you. <laughs> she said, certainly, husband. <laughs> Gave him the book. And he read passage after passage to her. One day when she was going for treatment, this red guard enemy of Christ, enemy of the message. Because of his godly wife's faithfulness, fell upon his knees by her bed 
And she said, when she came back in the room, he was weeping with his head in the Bible, saying, Jesus, I can resist you no more. The power of one man, one woman, is not the power of that one man or one woman. It's the power of Jesus through the Holy Spirit working through that person. There is the promise of Christ. He's going to use your life in ways you cannot imagine. Peter couldn't imagine those ways. Matthew couldn't imagine those ways. James and John couldn't imagine those ways. He will bless your life with Holy Spirit power. And he promises to be with you. The power, the promise of Christ, the power of Christ, the presence of Christ. Go to Matthew chapter 28 again. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And we're looking there at Matthew the 28th chapter. The last verse in the last chapter in the last of Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you. How long? How long? Always. Even to what? The end of the age. Jesus speaks to you this morning. He speaks to your heart this morning. I want to use you in unique in special ways. It may be to that person that comes to clean your house once a week. It may be to that checkout counter lady that you smile at as you go out through Publix. It may be the nurse at the hospital that you work with. It may be the retired guys that you meet with occasionally. But there's some man some woman, some boy, some girl. There's somebody that is waiting for that word of hope, that word of kindness. Somebody is waiting for that book that you're going to hand out, that piece of literature. Somebody is waiting for that prayer that you're going to offer for them. One person has made a difference down through the generations, and your life can be that one person that makes a difference. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the Apostle Paul said, I'm a debtor. We're in debt to Jesus for the way he saved us and redeemed us, delivered us from condemnation. The Apostle Paul said that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Help us never be ashamed of you. Help us know the power of one man, one woman is, can change the world. The world's a big place and it can only be changed as, as people are changed one at a time. Help us change not the world, but help us change our world. Help our world be different because we're here. We only live once. Life is short. We pass through it. We can never pass through it again. Help us, Lord, so that our world, the world around us, is different because we're here. So they see in us a picture of Jesus. They see in us his kindness, his love, and his compassion. Help us touch others with your love and with your grace. And help us, Lord, too, to know that your promise will be fulfilled, not simply by spectacular witnesses, but by ordinary people who do ordinary things, but things have become extraordinary because of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to know that your presence is with us always as we labor for you. In Jesus' name, amen.